British scientists played an important role in the development of the atom bomb. The British obviously played a key role in, in the parabola of Napoleon's career. I think that there are certain countries that have had their moment in the sun whose culture and history have therefore become part of global culture, and Britain's definitely one of those. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. Are we at the height of Western civilization, or are we in the midst of our decline? To discuss, I'm joined by the renowned historian Tom Holland, who has written a new book, Pax, War and Peace in Rome's Golden Era. Is the golden era of Western Christendom nearer its beginning or its end? Well, I don't think the word Christendom has really been applicable for several centuries now. Um, it's, it's a word that essentially went out of usage in the 17th century as Europe tore itself to pieces in the Thirty Years' War, the civil wars here in these islands. Um, so I think that we are well past what you might call the golden age of Christendom. Um, and in a sense, the idea of, of something called the West is an attempt to give a name to something that is no longer Christendom. So are we past the golden age of the West? Um, probably too early to tell. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I think that there are, uh, the question of how you define golden ages, even whether such things exist, is an open question. I think what is interesting about the, um, the Roman Empire in the first and second centuries is in a way that for us in the contemporary West now, it does serve as a kind of exemplar of what a golden age should be. In other words, it should be very stable, it should be prosperous, it should uh, cover a vast expanse of territory, um, and it should probably feature central heating and plumbing and maybe a temple or two. So it's really the thing that is mocked in the, the Monty Python, the famous thing, what have the Romans ever done for us? In that sense, the question of are we in a golden age, perhaps it's kind of implicit in your question, is to what extent are we like the Roman Empire in the first and second centuries AD? And I think to that extent, we're not very like them at all. To what extent is our civilization today shaped by Rome's golden era? I think very little, actually. Uh, and I think that that is one of the things that makes us in the West distinctive in comparison, say, to people who live in what was the other great uh, empire of uh, Eurasia in the first and second century AD, which is China. Because I think that there is a sense in which China today, although it's no longer ruled by an emperor, although in the 2000 years, uh, the past 2000 years, its dynasties have collapsed, it's been conquered, its frontiers have contracted and, and expanded again. So there is a constant sense of fluidity and disintegration and reconstitution. Nevertheless, I think you can say that China today is recognisably the heir of the empire that existed 2000 years ago. I don't think that you can say that about modern Europe. I think the salient thing about modern Europe is that it inhabits a space in which it's defined by fractures. So that is what makes the consolidation of the empire and its maintenance throughout this, this kind of two century period so remarkable. And of course, Rome is not ruling only, uh, only, only Europe. It's also ruling North Africa. It's ruling vast swathes of the Middle East. It's ruling the whole of the Mediterranean. No one, no one power has ruled the entirety of the Mediterranean seaboard since the Roman Empire started to fragment. So I think that purely in geopolitical terms, Rome is alien to us in a way that China, the Chinese empire is not to the contemporary Chinese. Presumably because of the title of your book, you do believe that there was such a thing as a golden era of Rome. I think that for those who lived through it, through the two centuries, um, it was indisputably the most stable, the most peaceable condition that any generation had any generations had lived through and that the the political order that succeeded it was obviously incredibly fragmented in comparison so the the, the, the various kingdoms and city states that came to comprise medieval europe the fact that you have the the inheritor of the roman empire i mean the byzantines saw themselves as romans and then the lands of the of the caliphate it's it's utterly fragmented for the romans the people who live in the Roman Empire, they feel themselves to be part of a coherent whole, and it was definitely a prosperous whole as well. 
Um, and so in that, to that extent, yes, I think it probably was a golden age. But there is a caveat to that, which is that the Roman word pax, peace, is a very active and aggressive word for the Romans. It, it, it's not passive in the, the, to the degree that it, I think it tends to be in English. The empire, the peace, the golden age was maintained at the point of a sword. So there are some very celebrated examples in this period of what happens to people who were not content to subordinate themselves to the Roman peace, and it's brutal and bloody. Why don't you just give a bit of context, very briefly, as to what Pax Romana was, how it came about, and just so that people who don't know anything about it can sure. understand. So in a way, the, the emergence of uh, an empire, a, a peace spanning the vast extent uh, that it does under, say, Trajan or Hadrian, so going from Scotland to the Sahara, from the Atlantic to the Arabia, is one of the most as astonishing historical narratives uh, in the whole field of human civilization, because it is, you know, it, it is the empire of Rome. It is the empire of a single city, and the gradual emergence of the peoples of this city, first to an Italian supremacy, then to a Mediterranean-wide supremacy, and then to a supremacy that reaches as far north at one point as you know, uh, upper northern Scotland, is stupefying. And by the time that this book is set, so the late first century, the early second century AD, this empire is founded above all on military prowess. It was, it was armies that had enabled Rome to conquer this vast expanse of territory, and it is armies that enable it to be upheld. And the reason that these armies exist is because the apparatus of tax collection exists. So money is collected to pay for the legions that enable the taxes to be enforced. So there is a kind of cycle there that runs throughout the period of, of, of the empire's heyday, um, and which maybe teaches a rather depressing lesson about uh, what, what is required for civilization back in antiquity. But it's one that is in, in which the sinews of war are, are basically taxes. Were the seeds of Rome's decline already sown by the end of the Republic and the beginning of Pax Romana? Well, the, um, the Romans themselves in this period, most notably represented by Tacitus, the greatest of all Roman historians, felt very despondent about the fruits of victory. So for, for Tacitus, Rome's empire, although it is the fruit of her martial ardor, her, her military prowess, threaten that prowess because the fruits of victory are, are wealth, prosperity, and the fruits of wealth and prosperity, Tacitus feels, are, are softness and innovation. And a soft and enervated empire cannot maintain itself. And so Tacitus casts sombre gaze over the free lands that lie beyond the Rhine and the Danube and thinks that these are the breeding grounds of people who in the long run will supplant Roman power because the Romans have lost the ability to uphold their, uphold their power. But the emperor in this period who, whose rule is most fated by the Romans, he is commemorated by them as the Optimus Princeps, the best of emperors, is the emperor Trajan, who in a way allows people like Tacitus, pessimistic conservatives, to feel that the Romans can have their cake and eat it because Trajan embarks on a series of astonishing conquests. He crosses the Danube and conquers what's now Romania, what was then called Dacia, and uses the money that he loots from the Dacians and from the mines, the gold and silver mines that they have, to fund the ultimate beautification of Rome. So if people think about how Rome looks in the film Gladiator, this incredible cityscape of, of marble and gold, essentially it is Trajan who puts the, the, the seal on that sense of central Rome, who builds the great ports that provide Rome with, with constant self-sufficiency in grain, so that the, the, the kind of the deep, deep sea harbour where there had previously been none, um, who, who, who adorns the city with baths and with libraries, um, who funds incredible extravaganzas and entertainments in the Colosseum. So 
it looks under Hadrian as though it is actually possible for the Romans to be simultaneously martial and dissipated. This doesn't last because, in Tacitus' opinion, the emperor who succeeds Trajan, Hadrian, who pulls back from many of Trajan's conquests and um, establishes a frontier system that to many Romans appears um, pusillanimous, um, he essentially is saying we're not going to embark on pointless conquests. Um, but it's important to emphasise that this is a, a pessimistic take and it's not one that most Romans hold. Most Romans, when they look at, the say, the most famous of, of Hadrian's military um, fortifications that we in Britain are so familiar with, the wall that runs from what's now Newcastle to, um, to Cumbria, they don't see a symbol of retrenchment or defeat. They see uh, basically what is the equivalent of a, a billionaire's electric fence keeping people out from his luxury estate. That's how Hadrian sees the empire. Hadrian's wall is a statement in stone to all the barbarians who lie beyond the limits of the empire. Not that they can't be conquered, but that they are not worth conquering. Um, and I think it's under Hadrian that you have a, a, a vision of the kind of the order and the prosperity that will endure for many centuries, for, for many decades after his death. And it's one in which... Um, peoples who had been conquered by the Romans, who had long had a status as defeated provincials, are starting to feel that they might even have a stake in the empire, that they might become Rome. And this, of course, is a glimpse of the future because that is what the Roman Empire will become. It will become an empire in which everyone comes to rank as Roman. As you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about comparisons with Pax Britannica. And during 1897, you had this amazing uh, jubilee for the Queen. Uh, Lord Salisbury was the Prime Minister at the time. Now, he was a very depressed Conservative figure who was always seeing doom around the corner, and he predicted the collapse of the British Empire. He was very much what one might call a doomer today. Um, it sounds like some Roman historians and some even Roman emperors have had this very Conservative view of their, uh, of their empire as well. Is that, so, as you say, that's not how most Romans uh, well, viewed it at the time. So Lord Salisbury famously said that, uh, I paraphrase, that uh, all change is bad and therefore it must be our aim to have as little change as possible. I mean, that is actually quite a Roman perspective. The Romans did tend... So novi race, literally new things, for the Romans is our equivalent of, of a revolution, an upheaval. And this was seen as being undisputedly bad. By and large, the Roman attitude was that uh, if change was necessary, it was best to dress it up in the robes of the past. So the exemplar of this is what Augustus does in the wake of the collapse of the Republic. Rome had been defined by its Republican system of government. This collapses in the age of Julius Caesar. So the question then is, well, how are we going to replace this? So what Augustus does is to, is to disguise the autocracy that he is planting under the show of a reverence for a kind of antique custom. And this again and again and again is what the Romans do. They always justify change as being... Uh, an expression of conservatism, which of course is basically what Lord Salisbury is doing as well. What made Rome special? Why wasn't it Carthage? Why wasn't it Persia? Why wasn't it one of the Hellenistic states that became this powerful empire? I think it's to do with the quality of its civic culture. The Romans under the Republic um, perfected a way of enshrining a very carnivorous meritocracy within frameworks that were solid enough to contain it. So in other words, the ambitions of its individual great men did not become so overreaching that it ended up destroying the very fabric of the Republic. And that held for several centuries. And so the desire to prove oneself worthy of uh, being fated by one's fellow citizens under the Republic meant that the great men of, the, of, of, of Rome in this period could uh, earn the goodwill of their fellow citizens by conquering barbarians or by building roads or whatever without seeming to be autocrats. This in the long run by the first century BC is a, is a, is a framework that is buckling and, and, and starting to collapse. And the whole Roman Empire could have imploded at that point. Um, the collapse of the Republic could have been terminal for the entire future of Ro the Roman order. That it isn't is down to the political genius, I think, preeminently of probably the greatest politician who's ever existed, certainly the greatest politician in the history of the West, and that is uh, Augustus.
who establishes an autocracy where previously there had been a republic and does so on such secure foundations that the empire he establishes lasts in a condition of, of relative peace for two centuries. And, you know, the empire, the Roman Empire endures until the 15th century. To paraphrase Gibbon, it's not why Rome fell, but how long it lasted that's yeah. most interesting. That is astonishing, yeah. What's your view on that? Um, I, I think that the, the great requirement of Roman rulers is, if you like, to keep the sinews that join the constituent parts of the empire in working order. Because I think one of the reasons why we don't live, say, in a Romania today in the way that the Chinese live in China is because there are so many physical fracture points across the geography of the empire, of which the Mediterranean is the most obvious. But you also have, um, you have the Alps, you have the Pyrenees, you have the Channel, you have the Rhine, you have the Danube. Uh, all of these are physically challenging in a, a pre-industrial order. And I think in particular, there is an incredible fracture point across the, um, across the center of the Mediterranean, which basically runs down the Adriatic. So if you think of the wars between Julius Caesar and Pompey, uh, and then the future Augustus and Mark Antony and Cleopatra, um, that is exactly the fracture point that by the late fourth, beginning of the fifth century AD, will establish a permanent rupture between what has become the western and eastern halves of the Roman Empire. So I think the, the reason that the empire endures as long as it does is because its rulers establish a framework for making sure that those sinews hold. And that is dependent obviously chiefly in the fact that they have a monopoly of violence, that they have this incredible professional army, you know, absolutely unprecedented in terms of, of, of what has gone before, that is at their beck and call but also that they provide the infrastructure that enables it to be effectively used, of which the transport system would be the most obvious example. Looking at some of the contemporary leaders we have today, do you see any comparisons in, an, in any of those great Roman emperors? Um, I think that the requirements of, of being an emperor in, in antiquity, in, in, in the Roman Empire, and being a, a, a democratically elected, elected leader in the West today, I think they're so different that any parallels has to be tendentious. That said, I mean, if you if you want to, to kind of play it as a game, which is always fun, um, the Romans had a word popularis, which meant someone who, who, who had an appeal to the populace, to the people. Um, and many of the most famous figures in Roman politics were populares. So Julius Caesar was a popularis, Augustus was a popularis, Nero was a popularis. Um, and I think that the key to the posthumous reputations of these populares was that they were content to win the approval and approbation of the masses, often by tugging the tail of the traditional elites. So Nero would be the, the ultimate example of this, that by um, playing the lyre in public or pretending to be an actor or racing the Olympics, he's not only casting himself in a heroic light before the gaze of the masses, he's also mocking the snobbery and the presumptions of the traditional elites whom he despises. Now the problem for Nero is that in the long run he goes so far that he he um, he precipitates a, a rebellion against him that results in his suicide and in terms of his long-term posthumous reputation it's the traditional elites who write the histories and so that's a crucial explanation for why his reputation is so poor. So go on let's so, play the game. So I think that uh, you will see exactly where I'm going with that which is that I, I think a key role say in the appeal of Donald Trump to uh, the American electorate who, who have voted for him is precisely that he is so shocking in terms of what he does. Uh, the one I always remember that, that it seems so shocking when I read it but also kind of very darkly funny was um, when he was asked about John McCain that who is such a Roman figure you know a, a a war hero, a man who refused to, to, to be released early from a prisoner of war camp um, because he didn't want to have special treatment. 
And Trump said of him, uh, you know, that I, uh, I, I prefer my war heroes not to be captured. Um, and this from a man who, what was it? He kind of said spurs on his feet that this was why he couldn't go and serve in Vietnam. So it's very darkly funny. And it's, it's a mockery of the traditional standards of the American Republic. So highly subversive. And when McCain died, all the presidents were invited. So Republicans and Democrats, and they all sat in a kind of somber line. But Trump wasn't invited. And I thought of, you know, the traditional senatorial elites and Nero in his golden house. I thought that maybe there is a faint, faint resemblance there. What about Joe Biden? Because he obviously is getting a bit older. You know, he's in his 80s. Sometimes he fumbles on his language. Um, you know, he has a bit of a stutter as well, but he makes up of these, these, these gaffes all the time. Were there any sort of Roman emperors who perhaps were getting a bit old, getting, getting a bit on, maybe were making the well, same? Well, the emperor who famously had a stutter was, of course, I, Claudius, um, the hero of the Robert Graves novels and the um, BBC adaptation. Um, I think Biden is, is too old, really, to have been uh, to, to have been a Roman figure, although that said, the Romans admired old age. So the senator comes from the word for for an old man. Senate is basically an assembly of old men, but the definition of old has has changed. Um, the 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 value that the Romans traditionally put on 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 maturity is measured by the fact that um, you couldn't become a consul in the Republic until you were forty years old. So for us, becoming 40 is very depressing. And did you Caesar, kind of feel, am I right, and he sort of had a loophole or something no, like that? No, Caesar, Caesar followed that. Caesar, Pompey didn't. Pompey, ah, okay. Pompey, uh, Pompey ignored, you know, didn't see a rule that he, he didn't feel able to ignore. But um, Who does Pompey remind you of? Who does Pompey remind me of? He doesn't really remind me of any... I mean, these are very, very different figures. Mm. Um, he was very we, boastful, wasn't he? And so, I mean, we, well... I can see who you're... No, I don't think there's any point of no, resemblance no. there at all. Okay. But I think that um, the, what happens with Augustus is that, that that kind of emphasis on age as a precondition for political office, the way in which in the Republic people were very happy to portray themselves as elderly. So if you think of Julius Caesar, he's shown, you know, his portrait bust, he's shown as balding, he's got crow feet, he's got sagging eyes, all this kind of stuff. Uh, Augustus, not at all. I mean, Augustus is consistently portrayed as youthful right the way to, to his, his death at a very, very kind of old age. And that youth matters to the emperors. They can get away with it in a way that earlier generations couldn't. And so it's often the case that um, after Augustus, who consistently portrays himself as, as youthful, those emperors who are more inclined to be a popularis will be portrayed as youthful. Those who are aligning themselves with more traditional virtues tend to, to, to appear older. Caesar was famously worried about his age when he allegedly hadn't done anything and he felt that he hadn't done anything in his life and he was always comparing himself with, uh, yeah, with Alexander. Yeah, supposedly, supposedly. Um, oh, that might be a myth, might it? I think it might be, Okay. yeah. When you were writing your book, how did the contemporary discourse around the Roman Empire enter your mind? How did you sort of tackle this modern historian's view of Rome? Well, it's not so much the modern historian's view as... Um, a, a sense that I have come to over the 20 years since I wrote Rubicon, which is my first book about, about Rome, set of, about the collapse of the Republic, the, the longer I think about them, the stranger and more alien they come to seem to me. So I was absolutely clear that in this book, I wanted to treat the Romans on their own terms, that I wanted it to be akin to science fiction, where you enter a world in which um, things that seem familiar are often made to appear strange. Um, and that that strangeness is something that I hope over the course of the book comes to seem less strange. So that even though the moral standards, the cultural assumptions of the Romans by the end are still seem, will probably still seem alarming and frightening to us, nevertheless they seem comprehensible. Because I think once you understand where the Romans are coming from, a lot of the dilemmas that they face come to seem very moving. Um, you can have, I think, a degree of empathy with them that you can't have unless you make that effort. Now, you are investigating an empire that conquered vast swathes of Europe, 
that colonised, that word colonisation, yeah. very controversial today. Obviously, historians looking back on British Empire, more, yeah. more recent empires, and, and sort of reimagining, re-examining, and some would say even distorting uh, history. How did that impact you in terms of when you were writing your book? Did you feel that you had to sense yourself in any way? Did you, did you think no, about these all. debates about the culture no. wars or anything like that? Well, so the book I, prior to this that I wrote uh, was called Dominion, and it was um, a book that advanced the thesis that the really great revolution in antiquity, the revolution that essentially transforms everything and makes what had gone before so hard to, to fathom and comprehend is is the coming of Christianity and that that has transformed our understanding so utterly that when we look back at the pre-Christian world it's as though we're you know it's it's a we're looking at a glass darkly there's a great sm Christian smear across our gaze that's very very difficult to penetrate so um, Pax in a way is a mirror image of that I'm trying to to banish what we know is coming. And it's not just the collapse of the empire, but it's the coming of Christianity. So in, in Pax, the Christians are there, but they are like tiny mammals in a cr Cretaceous ecosystem. Pax is focused on the dinosaurs, not on the mammals, who in the long run, of course, will inherit the earth. Um, so that's essentially why I, the Roman attitudes to empire, which are complex, ambivalent, sophisticated, but are not shaped by the Christian assumptions that I think determine how we see empire. I mean, our culture for a millennium and a half has had as its most, as its defining image, an instrument of torture, uh, the cross on which the Romans would torture to death slaves who opposed them. Um, Christ was put to death by the security apparatus of, of an empire. And so inevitably that induces all kinds of ambivalences in us who are the heirs of that, that, that Christian way of thinking. The Romans didn't have that way of thinking. So their, their, their ambivalences about empire were not our ambivalences. They were very, very different. The Romans wouldn't really understand what this term decolonisation even, no, even means. they would have had no idea of it. They would, it would have been incomprehensible to them. But you didn't feel that you had to write, let's say, from the perspective of the Persians or whoever were conquered by or the, or the Gauls or whoever? Well, I do. I mean, I, I, I do try and see. So um, to the degree that we can, it, it's difficult because often we don't have records of provincials. But for instance, we have an account of the destruction of Jerusalem by a Judean, Josephus. Um, we have quite detailed accounts of how the world looked to a highly educated but slightly impecunious Greek philosopher in the time of, um, uh, uh, of Domitian and Trajan. So we can do it. The perspectives of the conquered is a part of the story. But what's fascinating over the course of this period is that they too come to share in the long run in the Roman vision. That is how Gauls and uh, Judeans and Greeks come to feel themselves Roman. Uh, presumably you don't have a, uh, you don't make a moral judgment on the Romans in the book for that because some historians again are making these moral judgments about colonization of these peoples etc. No because, well I, I try to judge the Romans by their own standards. I, I, I do not want to import the moral standards of the Christian age that is coming, because that would be anachronistic. Ed West, the famous conservative writer, he compares conservatives today with the pagans of the Roman Empire versus the modern I think Christians. He's dignifying do, himself. <laughs> what do you think about that? I, I think that um, the anxieties and the hopes of the current age are still recognisably Christian. I think that the, the overthrowing of idols, the, uh, the ambition to banish superstition, the, the hope that um, ruling orders can be toppled, that the last can be first, that the first can be last. This is, these are recognisable dynamics that one can trace all the way back through Roman history. And of course, the first time that they manifest themselves on, the, in, uh, on a scale that, that people can write about them is in the Roman period. So to that extent, 
what we're going through is analogous to that, but it's not as though it's something that's unusual in the context of the centuries and centuries that have preceded it. There have been many reformations before the one that we're going through at the moment. Our anxieties are the anxieties, say, that people felt during the original Reformation, or back in the 11th century, or back in the 4th and 5th century. But this is the crucial point, is you do feel that it is, it is a Reformation, and yeah. that this brand of conservatism that existed, let's say, well, it still doesn't to a certain extent with some writers like Ed West and others, but it's far more popular 100 years ago, say. You feel that that is disappearing and something else is replacing it? I think that um, there's something in inherently unstable about any culture that founds itself upon Christianity. It's like building on the San Andreas Fault. It's always going to be shaken, it's always going to be convulsed. Because inherent in Christianity is the paradox that a way of understanding the world that has as its central image, as I mentioned before, the image of someone suffering the death of a slave on an instrument of torture, has become the most hegemonic way of understanding the world that has ever existed. And so there's an inherent tension there, uh, a tension between the identification with the weak, the suffering, the poor, and the sense that Christianity itself is hegemonic. And it's that that repeatedly has seen those who overthrow pre-existing orders in the name of what we might anachronistically call social justice, in, in the desire to see the last become first. But this jet just simply creates new elites that in turn then have to be brought down and destabilised. So the cycles of revolution and reformation that have punctuated the history of, of what your first question you call Christendom remains enduring. We're just going through another cycle of it. It's another, you know, a seismic incident. In terms of your own view on these debates, do you think that historians, there is a tendency among some, among some historians to distort history in a way that is unfair or inaccurate through a sort of woke lens? I think that uh, what, has what has become a a an escalating phenomenon over the past 20 years reflects the fact that, the, again, another paradox, that the current iteration of Christian culture is... Um, by its own self-estimation, an attempt to purge itself of Christianity, that it is anti-Christian for very Christian reasons. And this generates all, you know, great Moebius strip of, of cultural complications. Because if you are, if you're thinking, well, Christianity is, is hegemonic, the, the cultural inheritance of Christian civilization is hegemonic, therefore we must banish it because the last must become first. You're doing it for Christian reasons, but you can no longer draw on the Christian stories, the Christian myths, the Bible stories that traditionally have sanctioned these, uh, these, these, these kind of cycles of revolution and reformation. So you have to look for it elsewhere. So where do you look for it? So people are looking, I think, to history. Both history and pop culture, I think, as well. Yeah, but I think, I mean, you're talking specifically about history. I think there's a sense in which, um, you know, if you, want to, if you want to teach Christian lessons, you have to... Where are you going to look for it if not from history? So, you know, kind of favourite example of this would be um, the civil rights movement in the United States, which is entirely a Christian movement. I mean, it's utterly, wholly inspired by Christian teachings. But people can teach it without name-checking that. So you have the Christianity, but you don't need to consciously invoke it. So I think that that is, that is one of the distorting things that is happening at the moment, is that history is having to serve to fill in a kind of a, a, a gap that has been created by the ongoing reformation that we're going through at the moment. Um, I personally don't think that um, the, arc of, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice. I don't think that there are right sides of history, um, but it's important for our age because it's a very moral age and it needs moral lessons that history be made to, to teach those lessons. I mean, I think that's a fool's error myself, but I can see why people do it. 
Now, I suspect that you don't seek controversy. Maybe, maybe you do, I don't know. Well, I'm, uh, you're talking to a man who made a film for Channel 4 in which I claimed that Mohammed didn't come from Mecca. Well, this is so. my question. This is, this is the interesting thing. <laughs> I have thing. been known to. Yes, well, exactly. And, and you, you also wrote a book about Islam. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, um, Shadow of the Sword. So do, do you feel that you could write that book today and make that same documentary today in the current uh, climate? Well, I, I, the rules that govern the making of documentaries have changed. I mean, they're very, very movable. I was able to make that documentary, I think, because I, by great good fortune, happened to know the commissioning editor who liked my books. So it was purely happenstance in that sense. Um, if he hadn't liked my books, I'm sure I wouldn't have had the commission. Are you not diverse enough to be a presenter today? Is that sort of what you're saying? No, it's nothing to do with diversity. It's simply down to the fact that he liked my books and trusted me to make a good documentary. Right. But, you know, that's, you know, there could be you know, there are many commissioning editors who, of whom that wouldn't be true. And so I wouldn't have got to make the film. So I think, I think it's hugely down to, That's very literal, down to but, kind of luck. But what about the debates around Islam, that atmosphere around talking about Islam itself? I think it's become a lot easier, actually. Easier? Wow. Yeah, I think it's become a lot easier. If, I mean, you kind of forget the climate there was then because of all the, 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 the bombings, the mayhem, the, the wars in Iraq, the, the upheavals. I mean, it was... It was a time where the clash of civilizations seemed very vivid um, and there were huge public anxieties about Islam and there were huge anxieties among Muslims about what the West was up to. And I think that that, that sense of a kind of binary has faded, it seems to me. I mean, it may be because I'm not talking about it that I'm less, less embroiled in it, but it does seem to be less vivid. I mean, it may be not the case in France where you know, things are slightly different there. But certainly in this country, it seems a lot less toxic. Do you find it interesting that there has been this odd alliance in some cases, I'm not going to say in every case, between um, traditional conservatives in the West, in, in let's say Canada or the UK or wherever, and some Islamic communities uh, in terms of the reaction to far left progressive, progressivism, um, let's say LGBT well, sort of things? I think that um, Islam is, is a new constituent element within Western culture. And so um, both sides are, are having to negotiate exactly how it can be folded in. Um, I mean, absolutely, there are, there are clearly conservatives who think that Islam should be an ally against progressive values. Equally, there are progressives who feel that uh, Muslims as a minority are, should be aligned with them. But there are tensions in both sides, of course. Um, you know, if, if you're, if you're a, a Christian conservative, then to ally with Muslim conservatives is inherently an unstable thing. Equally, if you're a progressive, I think, is it in somewhere in America where uh, the, the progressive town, mayor has yeah. been kind of voted out and they've got a, a radical... Muslim, uh, all council, and they've banned pride and everything. That's so, right. so in both ways, it's a process of negotiation. So Harold Macmillan once said that Britain is Greece to America's Rome. Do you agree with that? <laughs> no, I think that vastly overrates our influence on America, which I think is pretty minimal. Um, Greece is hugely influential on Rome right the way through the course of its empire. I have very much doubt that, 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 that we could even approximate to that. Uh, so there are some uh, optimists, I have, I've mentioned conservatives throughout this interview, there are some liberal optimists like Stephen Pinker who say that we are living in the best time humanity has ever witnessed in terms of life expectancy, advancements in medicine and science and all these things. Do you think that we are as humanity living in a Pax or a golden age? I, th I think that fewer people are, in, relatively speaking, are in poverty today than has ever been the case. Uh, so in that sense, I think absolutely. The only question is what are the costs of that prosperity? In other words, have we taken out a massive mortgage and what is our ability going to be to, to repay it? I mean, I think that's the issue um, in terms of environmental collapse, uh, collapse of biodiversity, all of these things. Are we going to be able to restore the planet to a condition of health that will enable our current prosperity to be maintained? I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not qualified to answer that. I live in hope. Now, 
I have to ask about your podcast. This is something I'm sure lots of viewers will, will have listened to. The rest is history. It's become a bit of a phenomenon in the UK, maybe around the world as well. You're just back from America. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, what kind of podcasts do you listen to? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, I listen to my brother's podcast. Um, we have ways of making you talk, which is about the Second World War. You have to say that, no? <laughs> no, I do, I do. Um, I listen to very few others. Um, basically, I listen to, if I'm um, researching an episode for the podcast, I will often listen to podcasts on them if I don't have time to sit down and read books. So it's, it's determined, I think, much more by subject matter than by, um, than by being a loyal listener to certain podcasts. As in history... Because I'm actually, I mean, the, mm. the, the, the irony is, is that I'm... I'm I'd never really listened to podcasts before I started doing it. And I still don't really listen to podcasts very much. And a huge part of our audience is kind of under 35 because they're habituated to it. Um, so I, I still have the kind of, the, I'm not quite as bad as my, my mother who still can't work out how to listen to a podcast. I don't think she's listened to a single podcast that I've done because she can't work it out. Not quite that bad, but I'm veering into that territory. So you have a vast young audience, so that's interesting. Do, do you yeah. feel that you've But I think that's true of most podcasts. Well, have you popularised, or do you feel you've, to some extent, popularised history among a, kind of, among a younger generation? I, I don't know. I mean, based purely on the on, on what well, you the clearly stats. are, in terms of stats. Based I mean, on the terms of the yeah. stats, I guess. I mean, I, I hope so. I mean, in terms of look, look at the different mediums you've worked with as an historian, obviously you've done documentaries, you've, you've written... There's no question podcasts has the, the largest reach. Do you think? Yeah. yeah. Why I mean, is that? millions. What, 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 why, what do you think is behind that success? I think they're very accessible. Uh, I mean, if you, if you find you enjoy a podcast, you can. I mean, I, having said I don't listen to podcasts, I listen to, to cricket podcasts. So I do have my favourite cr cricket podcasts, for instance. So kind of niche areas. But I think if you find that you enjoy the company of presenters and you trust what they're saying um, and it becomes part of your daily or weekly um, media activity, then, you know, you adjust to it and, and that becomes part of the fabric of your life. So hopefully that's, that, that's what we're providing. I mean, I wouldn't know why, why, why it's worked because I'm not, it's not, it's not a medium that I'm really qualified to pontificate about. But, it, but it's, you know, obviously I'm completely ecstatic that, it, that it's worked out. I want to ask a bit about history in terms of pop culture and how history is portrayed in movies and TV and things like this um, today. So you did an episode on Oppenheimer, that's a new film that's coming out I think soon, um, to do with the chap who invented the nuclear bomb or as part of that process. Uh, obviously we saw a trailer recently for Ridley Scott's new film uh, on Napoleon, a big sort of biopic uh, film. Are you excited for these new projects? Do you feel that there's a real sort of um, interest in history today? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I think the way that history is reinterpreted and recalibrated is always fascinating because the bottom line is that history is infinitely fascinating. And I think it's fascinating because uh, it enables us to see ourselves reflected back in it. Uh, but I, as, I've suggest, as I've hinted, I think that that is flattering to us. I actually think the profounder source of fascination is that it suggests to us how infinite the ways of being human are. And I think that that is infinitely fascinating because every time you look at the past, you are seeing people who have been governed by assumptions and material conditions that are different to ours. And you realise how manifold the ways of being human are. I can't think of anything more interesting than that. There are, of course, as we've mentioned a lot in this interview, a sort of there is this re-examining of history, looking at different figures from the past that we haven't perhaps focused on before, particularly sort of these diverse characters and and sort of underrepresented, let's say, minority groups in history that haven't sort of we haven't necessarily focused on as a as Britain or as Western nations. Now, if we look at these films I mentioned, these are both focusing on white men from history. Do you think there's still kind of an interest in that as well? Well, they're they're both made by British directors. Uh, so I think it's inevitable that, that British directors are, are going to be more interested in figures that are familiar from traditional British history, or even though obviously Oppenheimer is American, Napoleon is, is, is French or Italian, if you want. <laughs> but, you know, these are figures who are kind of part of the British story. British scientists played an important role in the development of the atom bomb 
Um, British obviously played a key role in, in the parabola of Napoleon's career. So I don't think it's particularly surprising. Um, I think what, what, what is unusual is the degree of interest that um, by and large Europeans have shown in other cultures. Um, I mean, that is pretty unusual. Uh, I mean, Chinese or Arabs, you, can, you, can, you know, you will get geographers, you will get travel writers, but not in the volume, I think, that you get from Europe. Um, so in a way, there's nothing more European, nothing more Western than calls to decolonize ourselves. There was that film, was it The Woman King or Woman Queen? I forget. It was about... Um, oh, The Dahomey the, Warriors. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's one example. Well, of... no, you see, I don't think that's about, about Africa at all. I think it's about America. I think it's about... I mean, you know, there are lots of, of black people in America. So, of course, America wants to make films about that, that reflect that. It's um, when you get films uh, that proclaim that they are about Africa. I think almost invariably, if they're made by Western directors, they're actually about America. And just one last question. And it's interesting you talk about British history in terms of interest in that around the world. Now, we probably are a bit biased as, as British people who might watch British films. But it seems to me, just thinking about it, you know, I can think of 1917, Dunkirk, all of these films, not just about the Second World War, but the First World War, very much from a British perspective. They seem to be popular in America. They seem to be popular all over the world. Do you think that there is a particular interest in, in British history? And if so, why? I think that there are certain countries that have had their moment in the sun whose culture and history have therefore become part of global culture. And Britain's definitely one of those. Um, if, if you think of the, the kind of Sherlock Holmes, um, Alice in Wonderland, James Bond, these are figures who are, are, are you know, Lord of the Rings. These are figures that are recognised across the world. And so therefore a corollary of that is that there are certain ways of understanding British history that have a, 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 a an international resonance. So because of the, I guess, Agatha Christie or that kind of thing, there's a ready market for Downton Abbey. There's a there's a, a an enthusiasm for stories that uh, reflect periods of British history that are familiar to global audiences. Harry Potter would be another example. Familiarity with built boarding school stories, all that kind of thing. And I think the same is true of say of France, so that's why the film is being made and you know, Napoleon is, has a global resonance. And I absolutely think it's true of America. And I think that American history is, because, because America is, is the great cultural as well as economic superpower that it is, therefore America is able, much more than any other country, to determine globally how history is understood. Tom Holland, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you.